impeachment, NATO, and more. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. By the way, this just in, reportedly the Christmas tree will be lit artificially tonight. Uh, despite our best efforts, both on this show and on the radio show, uh, the, uh, the governor would bristle at this, but I find that she is more and more Trumpian uh, as, as the days go by. Her version, her brand of my way or the highway is not incredibly dissimilar. Hmm. Great to have you in. Thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, my guest is here to talk about the Christmas tree tonight. Uh, <laughs> kidding. Mark Janest has been on sabbatical, actually. He's been on, uh, uh, you know, another vacation to in, in, increase his mind and, and perspective. Uh, I'll get a little uh, travel agent uh, tidbit from him before we start in the serious stuff tonight, and there is serious stuff. The two conversations we'll have are about impeachment and the NATO summit, which the president left a little bit more abbreviatedly than we thought, and where he just threw out the book again on what is customary for a president to do and not do. What it all means, what's happening in the Middle East, all of that tonight. Uh, so let us start with a headline that uh, really is the conversation of the day, whether it was at your water cooler or not today, this was uh, quite an interesting professorial seminar on impeachment. Here was what the network had when we began our taping of this show at about mm, 139 and 33 seconds. The House Judiciary Committee is holding its first impeachment hearing to determine what constitutes an impeachable offense. We are empowered to recommend the impeachment of President Trump to the House if we find that he has committed treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. This is not an impeachment. This is just a simple railroad job. And today's is a waste of time. Four law professors were called to give their opinions, but CBS News contributor Jonathan Turley is the only witness for the Republicans. This would be the first impeachment in history where there would be considerable debate, and in my view, not compelling evidence of the commission of a crime. The witnesses for the Democrats disagreed. On the basis of the testimony and the evidence before the House, President Trump has committed impeachable high crimes and misdemeanors by corruptly abusing the office of the presidency. The House Intelligence Committee voted last night along party lines to approve a 300-page long report summarizing its investigation into President Trump's dealings with Ukraine. The report's key finding that President Trump used the power of his office to apply increasing pressure on the president of Ukraine to announce an investigation of a campaign rival, Joe Biden. There is precedent for recommending impeachment here. But Republicans questioned the methods used to generate the report and called for Intelligence Committee Chairman Adam Schiff to testify before the Judiciary Committee. Democrats voted that down. Welcome. Welcome back from Hawaii. Thank uh, you. Um, I'm going to get to that point in a second. How was your trip? Well, I was at the Asia Pacific Center as a visiting scholar. So it was a trip, and don't get me wrong, I'm not complaining, right, 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 but right. it was no, work. I, I know you were out there doing your work. Well, what were you gathering when you went out there? Um, I was there to teach students from the Pacific Command area of operations, so any, anywhere from uh, Asia through to the Polynesian Islands uh, and our allies in Southeast Asia as well. So. Important work? Yeah, and it was fascinating, because absolutely fascinating. Uh, one of the things is when you, when you go out to the South Pacific, you realize the problems of global warming. Uh, and particularly the rise of the ocean uh, has on small islands and even the coastal areas uh, in Hawaii and California. So that was really interesting to see. Security issue? Security issues, actually global warming is causing all kinds of security issues. Uh, there is a problem in Bangladesh that they're predicting over the next five to ten years that 12 million people will be displaced because of the rising sea tide. And as a result, that's going to cause all kinds of regional instability uh, throughout that area that we're not confronting and that Bangladesh, more importantly, doesn't know what to do about. So those are kinds of issues that we were talking about, as well as 
you know, the threat that China poses to both its people and the region. You know, whenever we talk about issues, Mark Ginesse speaks for himself, not from the Naval War College, where he teaches on a regular basis. But I, you know, for all the, all the time that we've known each other, you've been a friend of both shows for a long time, you, uh, you're not a left-wing liberal by any stretch of the imagination. Not that I know you're, of. You're not, in, you're not in the category. So that when you just go to global warming so quickly, yeah. um, you know, people who, who immediately knee-jerk react, anybody who asserts that global warming is real must be some left, leftist environmentalist wacko. Not the case. There's, there's growing consensus here. The president doesn't want, want to get it. A, a lot of leadership doesn't want to get it, but it's, it's a problem. No, but the U.S. military, particularly the Navy, is very concerned with it because they're going to be the forward-based force that is going in and trying to manage some of these emergencies. Why isn't the Navy more articulate about it? Why isn't it? Why, why, why isn't that happening? Well, the Navy, it is. Internally, it, it, it really is. Well, and, and a lot of conferences that, that the Navy holds and attends, uh, you'll see a lot of people talking about it. But uh, again, because the Commander-in-Chief has different views, uh, the Navy subsumes its rhetoric, or at least tamper, tamps down its rhetoric in order to you know, not cause too many political problems for the Commander-in-Chief. That said, we are still working very hard on these issues. Uh, let's talk about impeachment. That's not your, it's not your field of expertise, so I'll just, I'll just talk to you about it as a guy who follows the news cycle. Uh, what's your take so far? As, as a political scientist? Yeah. Uh, my take is that impeachment well, process. You know, so, so let me not minimize. I just I just don't want to pitch in your whole yeah, sure. I, into this whole thing. But you know, strategy and 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 you know, world affairs is really your is really your thing. I actually start out in politics, in domestic okay. politics. Well, then you know what? What is your <laughs> what is your professional what is your professional opinion on impeachment? Now this is a this is a higher conversation. My professional opinion yes. is that anytime you have an impeachment process, that is so divisive and partisan-wise that you're never going to get to any kind of constructive culmination of the process. And if the Democrats have been unable, up until this point, to gather any substantial Republican support, unlike even in the Clinton impeachment trial, there were Democrats that crossed the line and, and heavily criticized uh, President Clinton, even though he was not found guilty of impeachment. The Democrats have failed to do so. And as a result, Everyone sees this through the lens of partisanship, both members of Congress and the public, and it's going nowhere. Yeah, I, I hear you, and, and I think it's, it's, it's credible. The thing that I think is incredible, though, is that Donald Trump is a species unlike anything we've ever seen. His stranglehold on Republican elected types is significant, so much so I've never seen it like in history, where, where these people are so afraid of what the base will do to them in their districts, what the president will do to them in their districts, that that force that he is, that undisciplined force that he is, and that threatening force that he is, probably impacts this impeachment process unlike any other. Let me provide a counter argument. And then you can argue, well, you know what, the case isn't strong enough. Well, I mean, look, I, th I think... But go ahead. I think Push President back. Trump has done some things that are unethical, clearly unethical. The call wasn't perfect. Uh, no, no, it wasn't. And um, there's substantial evidence to say that he did something wrong, or at least he did something that was unethical. Whether or not it goes to the point of impeachment is a different matter. But we forget, when Bill Clinton was up for impeachment, the partisanship was strong and strident, and Democrats attacked the process. When I see news coverage of the current impeachment process, it's like it's done in a vacuum. There's no, com there's no real honest comparative uh, analysis of how parties uh, that support the president, what their strategy is. And it's precisely the same strategy that Democrats and the Clinton administration took uh, during that impeachment process, which was to attack the witnesses, the credibility of the witnesses, and to attack the legitimacy of the process. So if the Trump administration is using this strategy, uh, the same strategy as the Clinton administration, and it's still a strong partisan divide, the outcome will be exactly the same. Yeah, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. Uh, Bill Clinton was wholly more cooperative with subpoenas and with material, and Bill Clinton clearly lied. He perjured himself. And then there was an argument as to whether the perjury 
rose to the level of removal. Exactly. What, what, what's incredibly uncomfortable, I think, for most thinking Americans is that there's no concession on the Republicans' part, because the president won't concede, that what he did was wrong, unethical, intemperate, dangerous, uh, da 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 ba 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 if we could, I, this is what I've been saying all along, if we could get a consensus that that was the case, then we could have a legitimate argument as to whether it's impeachable. And the Republicans won't go there, and the Democrats haven't been able to force the issue to make them go there. Well, I remember when the Democrats said, look, it's just about sex. Therefore, you're not going to impeach a president over sex. Right. So that kind of argument really was very strong during the Clinton impeachment process. That said, I completely agree with you that Trump's Never, ex never announce that you have actually made a mistake. Right. But this has been the politics of the last 20 years. You know, when, uh, when Obama was, was told, hey, look, um, you said that you would never lose your health insurance, uh, your health care provider, um, if you followed Obamacare. Uh, and it was wrong. And he knew it was wrong. But it, he did not admit outright that it was wrong for a long, long period of time. And even I don't think today he has. So this... I think the 24-hour news cycle, the intense coverage, plus the partisan nature of the press makes politicians, or at least enables politicians, to never give an inch because they know at least one part of the media will always have their back. So I think this is more of a failure of the gatekeepers, the media, the news coverage that has become so partisan that it is difficult to find a moderate, middle, factually based reporting uh, that the public can rely on. Instead, we go to each one of our corners. If you're conservative, you go to Fox. If you're liberal, you go to CNN and MSNBC. That is the larger political problem that we have to deal with. Otherwise, our politics will remain just like it is today. Mm. It's because people don't read. There's plenty of there's plenty of straight down the line reporting as done in print. Um, but we well, don't even the we standard don't. New York Times is no longer the kind of place that you can rely on. It's overtly, overtly partisan, mm. and there's a little separation between their editorials there's and no their news coverage. There's no doubt that they've always had a left uh, a left twist. But they're, they're, if you if you did a fact check uh, on on the stuff that they have sourced, Washington Post as well. They're at the 80% correct level, and nothing's perfect, but this is a debate we could have for a long time. In the middle of all this, there was a NATO get-together, uh, another professional expertise category. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Normally, this stuff gets a lot of attention. Here was the latest from the network this morning. Leaders of the 29 NATO member alliance countries were all smiles as they posed for the ceremonial family photo this morning in London. But less than 24 hours earlier, some awkward moments between President Trump and close U.S. partners ruled the day, including French President Emmanuel Macron. Without to be clear on the fundamentals of what NATO should be. In a tense exchange Tuesday, Macron challenged President Trump on his handling of Syria. The first burden we share. The first cost we pay is our soldiers' lives. Unaccustomed to direct confrontation by leaders abroad, Mr. Trump fired back. Uh, would you like some nice ISIS fighters? Yes, I can give them to you. Don't make any mistake. Your number one problem are not the foreign fighters. This is the ISIS fighters in the region. This is why he's a great politician, because that was one of the greatest non-answers I've ever heard. <laughs> For years, Mr. Trump has railed against NATO, calling it obsolete and demanding members pay more. But on the 70th anniversary of the alliance, Mr. Trump has been much more embracing of the partnership, even while casting doubt on whether he would commit to defending any nation that falls short of pulling their weight financially. Well, in theory, you don't just say, that's okay, you don't have to ever pay. Seated next to Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, Mr. Trump called out the country for its contribution to NATO. They're not slightly delinquent, I should say, Canada, but they'll be okay. I have confidence. Just slightly delinquent. Hours later, Prime Minister Trudeau was caught on camera, apparently mocking Mr. Trump at a palace reception. The ethics of that video and audio being released are, are a whole other show, <laughs> right? 
I actually like the fact that the two of them were, were showing disagreement. It looked like a meeting. I don't think that's the end of the world. I, I think, and I can't give Trudeau credit. He, he, you know, you Canada is a substantial partner and a big place. If he's got a thought, he can articulate it. Sure, and he's in trouble at home. So anytime yeah. you take on Trump abroad, probably helps him back home. Right. But I think the Macron interaction was really interesting because yeah. the French president initially, when he first met Trump, was played the sweet role, a flatterer, doing all kinds of things to make Trump. And be ingratiate himself to Trump, uh, and now it's a 180 degree change, and he's much more comfortable confronting Trump. So I think his initial strategy he recognized was a failure. Now he's going to look more toward domestic uh, play and confront Trump more so forcefully. So where did. so where does this leave us security wise? NATO is is such a warm blanket for the United States of America, right? And this president seems to have a whole lot more warmth for guys like Putin. And the leaders of Korea and Saudi, and his inclination is is literally to keep NATO at more than arm's length. He doesn't like them personally. He doesn't like the countries and the way they operate. What? What? what what's the what's the security ramification of all that? NATO will endure. It'll survive past this presidency because for it is such eight years. For four or eight years? Yes, because it's in the enduring interests of all the countries involved to maintain this alliance. Now, Trump does make some legitimate points. The Europeans, for decades, I mean, you can go back to Eisenhower the complaining yeah. that the NATO allies don't live up to their responsibilities in spending on defense. So that's credible. I mean, that's a, that's a very important point. The problem is the way he goes about it. Uh, the, the lack of diplomatic skill is, is just astounding. He could get a lot more done if he took a more constructive but, engagement. But, but, Professor, isn't that always been the thing? I mean, the guy may land or try to land in the right spot, and I might agree with him on a whole lot more, but his process by which he gets there so rips up his effort to get there that getting there seems to get lost. And. The irony is, is that the electorate wanted, you know, was, the electorate's been so angry that they wanted the bluster, they wanted the unconventional, they wanted the disruptor, and now they're starting to see that the breakdown of institution and diplomacy and all that kind of stuff, it, it matters. For Trump, I don't think it's the political objective that matters as much as the show in getting there. When is, it, when is America going to, well, maybe in 2020 they'll see it, I don't know. Depends on what the Democrats do. Right? <laughs> right? I'm not very optimistic but about what But people like you who can see things for what they are, we're not moving the ball forward, are we? Well, in certain areas we're certainly not. I mean, relations with our key allies uh, are really going through a rough period, and that's because of the bluster of the president. But in other ways, uh, you know, the, the United States has a very strong military. The United States continues to have global interests uh, and continues to grow economically. And if you compare us, remember, we're the lone superpower. And even though China seemingly is a rising superpower, the more you look internally in China, the more it's imploding. In Hong Kong, Economically, their growth is actually a negative growth, even though the Chinese continue to lie about their economic growth. So there are a lot of internal problems. In international politics, all you have to do is be less incompetent than your adversaries. So far, we're less incompetent. Not a lot less incompetent, and we could be a lot more competent, but right now we're still, I'd rather be the United States than China. I would rather be the United States than the EU. So we're still looking pretty good. I don't want to be overly negative about our outlook, because overall we're still a very strong nation with a lot of resources and capabilities. And what about Russia when we come back? Well, NATO and the EU are, are all concerned about Iran, uh, as is the President. Um, We've long talked about about the Middle East. You know, Iran made some maneuvers yesterday that don't seem to be imminently dangerous, but clearly they're in a kerfuffle. They've just taken out a whole bunch of their own people. Their internal strife is keeping them distracted. One would hope. Would hope. When I said Russia, I, I thought when you talked about China and you talked about 
uh, you know, its internal strife and being less incompetent than China. Are we less incompetent than Russia right now? Because Russia seems to have taken advantage of some of these Middle Eastern moves that the president has made with northern Syria, Turkey, and the like. Well, where are they in this mix of incompetency? Hmm. That's a great question. Uh, I would say since 9-11, 2001, that there are two winners over the last two decades, Iran and Russia, and they're intimately intertwined. We made the Middle East safe for Iran by going into Iraq, by getting caught in a quagmire in Afghanistan, because our influence in that region is significantly weaker than it was in 2000. So that's, Iran is the winner because we were much less incompetent in that, their region of the world. Russia took phenomenal advantage over the Obama administration, over the red line. Remember the red line in Syria? Right. And that allowed Assad to invite the Russians in. By the way, that was Obama's red line. That was Trump's. Obama's red line, yeah. right. Um, and that allowed the Syrians and Assad to invite the, invite the Russians into Syria, and they came in pretty heavy. And now they are the dominant outside power in Syria. So Putin has taken advantage of a poor hand and played it extraordinarily skillfully. And how does this, because we only got a minute here, so how does the Ukrainian debacle and all this political thing over Ukraine and Russian intervention in the election and trying to convince Russia, trying to convince us that it was Ukraine and all that, uh, how does that all play into their, into their power base right now? Well, it diverts attention. I mean, that's the, that's the great Russian strategy here. Um, while Russia is doing all kinds of nefarious things, like killing its own people, trying to intervene in elections in Europe and the United States, uh, it's trying to point the, uh, the problem in a different direction. And unfortunately, the Republicans are playing along with that by emphasizing what Ukraine has or has not, more importantly, done. Uh, in involving American elections. Finally, Lindsey Graham came out and said it was Russia, it was Russia, it was Russia yesterday. 100% Russia in the intervention. Um, but can I, we got 30 seconds. Sure. The good news is Russia is an economic basket case. He it literally is a failed state with nuclear weapons, and Putin has been able to essentially force people to think about their foreign policy rather than their serious domestic concerns. And the same goes for Iran. Iran is a failing state. It's imploding from within because its ec economy has failed, because its autocratic rulers are failing as well, and the people are starting to rebel. Democracy wins. Let's hope. Yeah. Tell the president that. <laughs> Thanks. Welcome back. Final word, and we come back. Stay with us. Okay, over the next couple of days, we will take a look at what's happening in Pawtucket, kind of dig in a little bit deeper on that $400 million investment that is happening there, something that I think the public has been somewhat ambivalent about. And I joked with Mayor Don Grebian yesterday on the radio that if the public is ambivalent about it, he's probably ahead of the game. Because the last time he tried to develop with the Paw Sox, some of the public, the louder voices, weren't very calm about it. We'll, uh, we'll be on that and follow up, of course, on this impeachment stuff tomorrow and on the radio at 3 until 6 on WPRO. Have a great night. See ya.